Hello, lads and lasses. Hey, if you like today's lesson, then please become a bus driver. And when you have a full load of passengers, recklessly drive very fast, ignoring traffic lights, signs, and other drivers. And then announce you won't stop until every one of your passengers signs up for our classes, as this would really help spread the good word. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Okay, today we're going to be talking about Greek art, and I think for the next uh, couple of days as well. Um, so the, the Greek art that we're going to be looking at lasted from about 500 to 30 BC. And so why do you think that the numbers go backwards? Why doesn't it say 30 BC to 500 BC? And the answer is because this is BC. Uh, it's like a number line where you have numbers that are negative. These are like negative numbers that the farther they go from the uh, point zero or the, the, the zero, the higher the numbers get. So if they are going to the left before the zero, then the numbers get bigger towards the left. All right. So what does BC mean? All right. BC means before Christ. And then what does AD mean? By the way, I want you to write these down. <coughs> AD, a lot of people think it means after death, and that's not what AD means. AD stands for Anno Domini, and that's a Latin term for the year of our Lord. So write this down. AD stands for Anno Domini. Now, in uh, recent history textbooks, they changed BC and AD to BCE and CE. So BCE stands for Before the Common Era, and CE is the Common Era. So... Uh, BCE is just like BC and CE is just like AD. Be sure and write all this down. If you need to stop the video, then go ahead and do so. All right, so let's take a look. I'm going to show you where Greece is. Uh, can you find America on this map or can you find where we live? And yeah, that's where we live. And Houston is right about at the tip of that arrow. We're right on the Gulf of Mexico. And what ocean would we have to cross to get to Greece? And by the way, what continent is Greece in? All right. Uh, most people know that Greece is in Europe, and we would have to uh, cross the, um, the Atlantic Ocean to get there. So this is the Atlantic. This is the Pacific. And Greece is right in that area right there. All right. So let's take a closer look at Greece. This is what the country of Greece looks like. And you notice that it has tons of islands on it. There's a few things that I want to point out on this. And the first one is Athens, the city of Athens. That is where the most of our art is going to come from. Almost every single piece of art that I'm going to show you in these next couple of days comes from Athens. So that's what we're talking about when I say Athens. Um, down at the bottom, uh, you may have noticed the city called Sparta. Uh, you may have heard of Spartans before. Does anybody know what Sparta is famous for or what Spartans are famous for? And that is right. Spartans are famous for being warriors. That is a warrior civilization. Uh, and one uh, in a recent movie that they've uh, been in, the movie 300, they were talking about their culture. And in other cultures, you have uh, people that are trained to be potters and educators and people that do roads and people, architects and builders and uh, woodworkers and blacksmiths. But in Sparta, everybody is a warrior. You're a warrior first. And then you have a secondary trait of building or architecture or uh, uh, blacksmithing or make shoes or whatever. So uh, that is a warrior society. And I want to tell you uh, about Thermopylae. The Thermopylae is here on this map. And uh, recently in the movie 300, uh, this movie is about what happened at Thermopylae. Although a highly um, uh, stylized view of what happened in Thermopylae. But it's rather, it's a really cool story. 
All right, so Thermopylae is a tiny little uh, uh, edge of land, right? And and on this inner map right here, so Thermopylae is right here on this map, and there's this little pass. There's this little like edge, uh, like a little strip of land, and uh, there's cliffs and mountains right here, and there's the sea, and these dotted lines indicate where the Persians were attacking the Greeks. And so the Persians had to cross this tiny little strip of land, and that's where the Spartans made their stand. And so on this tiny little strip of land that was only 14 meters wide, the Greeks or the Spartans uh, uh, blocked the way for the Persians that were trying to come through. And... You know, the movie 300 talks about there being 300 um, uh, Spartans. The actual number was closer to like 3,000. Um, but there were 300 Spartans and 2,700 other Greeks that were there to stop the Persians. The Persians numbered up close to a million. And the Greeks were able to stop the Persians for a while uh, to let um, other Greeks and other parts of Greece uh, uh, get fortified. So this is kind of, this is what it looks like in the movie, the Greek shields and the Greek, uh, um, helmets and everything. This is how they made their wall that went from the sea to the, um, to the cliffs. And here's a image of what it looked like. And then somebody made this battle of Thermopylae out of Legos. So these are all little Lego people. And if you get a close enough view of it, so you can see the Legos that are dressed up like uh, Spartans and then the Legos that are dressed up like the Persians. And that's kind of how, that's how the Greeks held off a million Persians that were trying to get through and attack Greece. It was a pretty cool story. All right, so that was Thermopylae. And another one I want to point out is uh, the city of Marathon. And what is a marathon? Do you know what a marathon is? Most of you know what a marathon is. Uh, a marathon is a foot race. So here's a, a picture from the Boston Marathon, one of the most famous marathons that there is. And you can see that's written right here. It's a marathon. is a race. Do you know how long a marathon is? A marathon is 26.2 miles. So why do they choose 26.2 miles? Well, there's a story behind that. So uh, in Greece, there's a bay called Marathon. And just beyond the bay, there's a city called Marathon. And the once again, the Persians were trying to attack the Greeks. So the Persians had uh, come up on their boats and disembarked on their boats. And they had an army that was on its way to Athens. <coughs> and the Greeks from Athens and Sparta were there to stop them. And the Greeks were able, and the Persians, there were more Persians than there were Greeks, but the Greeks had better tactics and they had a better ground from which to uh, attack from. So they pushed the Persians back into their boats at the Battle of Marathon. Now, when the Persians got in their boats, they went to sail around this uh, part of land to go and attack Athens over here because Athens was left undefended. All the Athenians, all the Greeks, were uh, over here in Marathon. So if they went around, they could attack Athens uh, uh, by surprise. So they sent a runner from marathon to run across to Athens. This guy ran and the distance from marathon to Athens was 26.2 miles. And his, he had the message of that they beat the Persians at marathon and to prepare because the Persians were on their way to uh, attack Athens. And so when he, and when he arrived there and delivered his message, he collapsed from exhaustion and died. That's why marathons are 26.2 miles. Okay, so I showed you uh, Athens, and I showed you Sparta, and I showed you Marathon, and I showed you Thermopylae. 
uh, the next two cities I want to show you are Thebes and Delphi. And I have a story to tell you about Thebes and Delphi. And this is the story of Oedipus Rex. All right, the story of Oedipus Rex starts in the city of Thebes. And in the city of Thebes, you have King Laius and Queen Jocasta. And they had a baby. And the king went to Delphi. And inside the temple at Delphi, there was a, uh, a prophet, an oracle. And what would happen is the priests inside the temple would uh, lean over the cracks that were in the ground and vapors were coming out of the cracks. And the priests would inhale the vapors and then have visions of the gods talking to them. And so somebody would ask the gods a question. Uh, and the question in, in this case would be, you know, what's to become of my son? Anytime somebody important would have a child, you would go to the oracle and the oracle will tell you what's in the future. It's kind of like a fortune telling. The oracle told King Laius that his son would cause Thebes to fall, would cause Thebes to come into ruin. And he didn't want that. So he tells his wife, Queen Jocasta, to kill the baby. And Queen Jocasta cannot do it. She can't kill her own son. So she gives the baby to a servant and tells the servant to take the baby up into the mountains and leave it for dead. So the servant wraps the baby up in twine, ties its arms together, ties its legs together, and takes the baby up to the mountains, leaves it in the mountains, and then comes back to Thebes. Well, the baby gets found by a shepherd, and the shepherd names the baby Oedipus, which means uh, uh, swollen foot because of the, the, the twine that was held to uh, tie the baby's feet caused them to swell, so he called it swollen foot. Well, the shepherd takes the baby to Corinth, and gives the baby to King Polybus. King Polybus is unable to have children. And so he raises the baby as his own. And Oedipus becomes a full grown man. And uh, one day he hears a rumor that he's not the son of Polybus. So he goes, whoops, he goes to Delphi and he asks the question, uh, who are my real parents? Well, the Oracle at Delphi doesn't answer that question, but it says, you are destined to mate with your own mother and with your own hands shed the blood of your sire. That means his father. That means he's going to have sex with his mom and uh, kill his father. And uh, he is horrified by that because that's, that's a terrible thing to have been told about you. And he still believes that King Polybus is his father. So he leaves Corinth and goes to Thebes thinking that he can spare himself and his father from this uh, horrible, horrible uh, uh, fortune telling. On the way from Corinth to Thebes, he comes across a uh, like a caravan or, or a wagon that has an old man in it who has some servants. And they get into an argument about who has the right of way because the old man in the, uh, in the cart tried to run him over. And so they argued. And in the argument, he pushed the old man. The old man fell and died because he was frail. And then the servants attacked Oedipus, and Oedipus was able to kill the servants in self-defense. So that happened on the way to Thebes. Once he gets to Thebes, he sees that Thebes is under a um, horrible uh, um, plague. And, uh, uh, it, and things are awful in Thebes. And before he actually gets into the city, he's stopped by a sphinx. And the sphinx, let's see, I, I don't have any other pictures, but um, the sphinx was uh, killing and eating people that could not solve the riddle. And the sphinx also was a part of the reason why there was a plague in the, uh, in the city. So the sphinx asked Oedipus the riddle. And the riddle is what walks on four legs in the morning two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening. 
Well, Oedipus was a pretty smart guy and he's able to answer the question. His answer is man who as a baby walks on four legs because he crawls. And then as an adult walks on or a child and an adult walks on two legs. And then in his old age, uh, uses three legs, which is a cane and his legs. And then that's the answer. So uh, he solves the riddle of the Sphinx and it causes the, the uh, Thebes to have no more plague. And he gets rewarded for that. He becomes the king. And part of being the king is that he marries the queen, who's, uh, uh, who the king had just recently been killed. Um, so it turns out that the man that he killed on the way to Thebes was the king. He didn't even know it. He just thought it was some old man and his servants. Well, that was the king and his servants that he killed. And it turned out that was King Laius, his father. And then now he's married to his mother, Queen Jocasta. And so uh, the prophecy has been fulfilled. Soon after that, Thebes is hit with another plague. And they go to uh, King Oedipus sends, uh, by the way, uh, Oedipus doesn't know that the old man was his father. He still doesn't know that the, his wife is his mother. Uh, he still thinks that Polybus is his father. He still thinks that he grew up in Corinth or that he was born in Corinth. So he's oblivious to all this. Anyways, as king, he sends a uh, priest to go to Delphi to find out why there's another plague. And the oracle tells him that the gods are angry because the murderer of the king has not yet been caught. Well, long story short, but this is a great story. He makes an investigation into the murder of the king, and it reveals the whole truth. It reveals that queen, his wife, his queen, is his mother. And it reveals that the old man that he killed on the trail uh, was his father. And he is horrified, absolutely horrified at what he has done. The queen, when she learns the truth, she kills herself. And when Oedipus realizes what he's done and he sees that his mom slash wife has killed herself, he uh, blinds himself. He sticks pins in his eyes and blinds himself and he is exiled with his daughters. And that's the story of Oedipus Rex. But uh, anyways, that takes place, uh, well, I'll just go this way. That takes place in Thebes and Delphi. All right, the next place I want to show you guys is uh, Samothrace. Uh, there's a famous sculpture that comes from that. And then finally, I want to tell, show you Troy. Have you ever heard of the city of Troy? Well, Troy was a, a famous city, and the most famous thing that happened there was the Trojan War. And I don't know if you know what uh, what started the Trojan War, but it was started by an apple. You ever heard of a, a war being started with an apple before? All right, so the story goes like this. Uh, Mount Olympus is the place where all the gods lived. And there was a wedding. So a couple of gods, well, a god and a goddess were getting married. Um, it wasn't any of the major gods, but there was a big wedding. And so there was a big feast of all the gods and the goddesses. And everybody was dancing and laughing and having a great time at the party. And everybody was invited to this wedding party except for one person. And that one person was Eris. Eris is the goddess of discord. And uh, I don't know if you know what discord means, but basically it means that Eris is a troublemaker. And so now you understand why she wasn't invited. She wasn't invited because she would have caused trouble. Well, once she learned that she was invited, was not invited, she caused her trouble. So what she did is she made a golden apple, and on it she wrote, for the fairest, which meant this golden apple is for the most beautiful person. And she threw it into the wedding party. And immediately, three goddesses started fighting over it. It was Hera, the wife slash sister of Zeus. It was Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom. It was uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. And so all three of those goddesses were fighting over the apple. And they went to uh, Zeus to ask him, let's see, I'll, I'll get before that. They went to Zeus to ask him before, uh, ask him to judge which of them was the most fairest. And Zeus was really smart. He said, I am not going to judge 
because it doesn't matter who I choose, the other two will be angry at me. So then they decide to get an impartial uh, uh, opinion. So they appear before a boy named Paris. That's Paris over here on the left sitting on the tree. This right here that's holding the apple is Hermes. He's got his winged feet and his uh, helmet. And he's the messenger of the gods. And then these are the three goddesses right here. This is Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. And all three of them are asking Paris to judge which of them is the fairest, which of them is the most beautiful. And uh, to sweeten the deal, all three goddesses offer him gifts if he should choose them. Athena offers him great glory in battle, and Hera offers him uh, a kingdom of his own to rule. But uh, Aphrodite offers him the love of the most beautiful woman in the world. And that's who he chooses. He chooses Aphrodite, the goddess of love, as the most beautiful, uh, and she gets the golden apple. So Aphrodite arranges for Paris, that's him on the right, to fall in love with Helena, that's her on the left. Helena was perceived to be the most beautiful of all the gods and goddesses, or all the, of all the people in the world. Sorry, she wasn't a goddess. But... Uh, so they fell in love. But the problem was, is that she was already married. She was a princess. No, she was a queen. She was married to Agamemnon. Anyways, Aphrodite causes her to fall in love with him, him to fall in love with her. And so they, he takes her back to the city of Troy. This is Troy right here. But the problem with that is, is that her husband is a king and he is totally upset he is really angry that she has been basically kidnapped and taken away so he gathers all of his other king friends and all their armies and they go lay, lay siege to troy so in this map right here these this is all these are all the greeks and all the greek nations and together all of them are going to sail up and go to troy and uh attack troy so this is kind of what the battle looks like. This is the city of Troy up at the top. These are the Greek ships that are on the beach. They've made their camp down here. And then uh, the, the Trojans and the Greeks, every day they fight in the area between Troy and the ships. And sometimes the Greeks do really well and push the Trojans all the way back into their city. And sometimes the Trojans do really well and push the Greeks all the way back to their ships. But it's a stalemate. You know, neither, neither side wins this battle or wins the war. And this war goes on for 10 years. And after 10 years, oh, by the way, this is what it kind of looks like. So these are the Greeks that you're looking at. And that's the city of Troy in the distance and the Trojans in front of the city of Troy. And every day they fight uh, between the city and the beach. Okay, so after 10 years, the Tro uh, the uh, Greeks are really tired of being, uh, uh, of being there. They miss their families. They've been away too long. Uh, things are going on back home that they need to take care of. And uh, so they are wanting to give up, but they're also not wanting to give up to the uh, Trojans. So how can they, if they can't beat them and you can't give up, what can you do? Well, they came up with a trick, and that trick involved a, um, a Trojan horse. So let me back up to this map. So here's what happened. They, they, all the Greeks get inside their boats, and they go sail around to a nearby island and hide on the other side of the island. And they left behind a Trojan horse or, or a giant horse. And uh, back in these days, when you surrender to an enemy, you have to give them a gift. And so this was the gift to show that they had surrendered. And so it's a giant horse. Uh, but inside the horse, there's a few soldiers. But the Trojans don't know that. So the Trojans look out to the beaches. They don't see any Greeks. And they see a uh, horse left behind. And they see it as a gift. And so they are just absolutely happy with this uh, uh, present. They're happy that the war is over 
And what they do is they party all night long. They bring the horse inside the walls and they party. They drink, they eat, they dance. They absolutely have a huge party and everything is great. But inside that horse, there's a few Greeks. And when all the Trojans are done with partying, it's like, you know, three o'clock in the morning. They're hung, you know, they're tired. They've been dancing all night. They've been drinking all night. They've been eating all night and they're tired. And the whole city falls into a deep sleep. The few, tro the few Greeks that are inside the horse sneak out, kill the guards at the top of the walls of Troy, open the gates and signal for all the Greeks to come back in. And all the Greeks come back from hiding behind the island and lay siege to Troy and burn it to the ground. And that, my friends, is the story of Troy. Oh, I thought this would be funny for you. I don't know if you guys watch Family Guy, but I think this is funny. It's like when we tried to invade the city of Troy, and it says, Peter, I don't think this is the right horse. And they get, it's because they actually got inside of a real horse instead of a big giant wooden horse. I think it's funny. All right. I like memes, and I like uh, Greek memes. All right. So let's get into the art of Greek. Uh, let's get into the, the art side of Greek art. So uh, I'm going to show you guys some Greek vases. There's black figure vases and there's red figure vases. All right. I want you to write this down. This is a definition. Black figure vases means a red background and black figures. And figures means people or objects. people or objects. So here's a good example of a black figure vase. And uh, so here's the vase and all right, so here's how this works. Um, it looks like it's been painted on, but it hasn't. It's actually different types of clay. And uh, so clay, here's how clay works. It is, You've worked with clay before. It's soft. You can bend it. You can mold it. You can put it into different shapes, and uh, it's kind of fun to work with. So they make, they use, they bend and mold the clay into a vase. And when it gets hard, when it dries out, it gets hard, and but it's still very brittle. And so in order for it to be to become hard enough to contain water, you have to cook it in an oven. It's a special oven called a kiln. And so they cook it in these ovens, in these kilns uh, at very high temperatures, and it causes to the clay to solidify and uh, to, you know, be like, um, it's called uh, fired clay. And you can use it uh, for carrying food, for carrying water. Now, some types of clay, when you fire them in the kiln, turn black, and other types of clay turn black like this reddish orange color uh, that's called terracotta. And so that's what we're looking at right here. We're looking at, they have painted images on the pot to look like black or this reddish orange color. And they're just using different types of clay. It's not paint. By the way, Achilles and Ajax are two heroes from the Trojan War. And here they are playing a, a, a board game instead of fighting each other and killing each other. I think that's how all wars should be fought, with uh, board games. Okay, here's some more black figure vases. Notice that the background is red, and then the people are black. And then a hydria, write this definition down. A hydria is a vessel used for carrying water. And here I chose these particular hydrias, which is kind of cool because in, all right, so a hydria has a narrow, uh, a wide base, a narrow foot, or a wide foot, a narrow base, and a wide body, and a narrow neck, and a wide lip. And it has these two handles on the side. This is what the shape of a uh, hydria looks like. And what's cool about these two images right here is that actually on the hydria 
they have pictures of people using the hydria. So these ladies are carrying it on their heads. And then this lady right here has a hydria down below this, almost looks like a lion's head. And out of the lion's head is water coming out. And she's filling up her hydria. Over here on this one is a uh, lion's head where the water's coming out. And then here's a deer's head where the water's coming out. And the woman is filling up her hydria. Okay, here are some more uh, vases with black figures on them. Uh, I do want you to write down these two definitions, one for Dionysus. He's the god of wine and revelry. And here he is right here, and you often see him with grapes and with cups that have drink in them. And then this guy right here, I'll talk about Heracles in a minute, but I do want you to write this down, uh, son of God, strongest man alive. And also he was the... Uh, he was the only mortal to become a god himself. All right. So, oh, and then in A.D. Painter, I want you to write that down. He painted vases. In Greek art was the first time that people started signing their artwork. Before this, there was no, uh, nobody signed. And even though this right here is an A.D. Painter, but this is somebody's name right here. I don't even be begin to ask me to uh, pronounce this because I, I, I wouldn't be able to. But A.D. Painter painted all of these. He always signed it A.D. And nobody really knows what A.D. stands for, that there's no documentation as to what his name actually was. But uh, anyways, it was the first time in the world that people signed their artwork. All right, we've been looking at black figure vases. Now I'm going to show you red figure vases. Write down this definition. Red figure means it has a black background and then the people are red or the figures are red. So here's a couple of examples of red figure vases. The background is black and the people are red. These are red figure vases. Oh, by the way, this is uh, a red figure vase of the story of Oedipus Rex and, and the Sphinx. And so here's Oedipus talking to the Sphinx. And then this is Oedipus going to the Oracle. And the Oracle is telling him uh, about, about what is going on. All right, next I want to teach you guys about Athena. Write down this definition. Athena was the goddess of war and wisdom. Write it down. All right, so uh, this particular uh, vase right here shows you the birth of, of Athena. Uh, this is a black figure vase, and that guy right there, that is Kronos. He was the first god, and all the other gods or like the, all the major gods were born from him. So Zeus, he gave birth to Zeus. He gave birth to Athena, Hera, Poseidon, and uh, Hades, Ares, Aphrodite. All the major gods and goddesses uh, he gave birth to. And then that's little Athena coming out of his head. They were born out of his head. I know Greeks have like weird ideas about how this stuff happened, but... Uh, that's where she was born from. She came out of his head. Okay, I'm going to tell you the story of Athena's Aegis. All right, so we'll begin with King Acrisius. And uh, he wanted a son. So he was very, um, he was the king of Argos. And I don't know if you ever heard of Jason and the Argonauts. Well, that's Argos. Argonauts come from Argos. Um, he was he really wanted a son and he was really bothered that he didn't have a son. So he sent a priest to Delphi and I want you to write down this definition. Delphi is a special temple. Uh Oh, I spelled that wrong. Typo. Next space. Okay. Let's try this again from current slide. All right. Uh, he, it was a special temple where the, priests would talk to the gods and the gods would uh, talk back. So he sent a priest to the, to the Delphi to ask why he won't have a son. 
And the gods told him that his that the uh, son of his daughter who hadn't given birth yet would kill him. All right, so he had a daughter named Diane. I'm going to call her Diane instead of Dane. I'm going to call her Diane. So his daughter, Diane, um, did not have a son, but the Delphi told him that his grandson would kill him. Well, he only had the one daughter, so he imprisoned his daughter in a tower so that she could never like become pregnant. And Zeus, and I want you to write down this definition, Zeus, he's the god of gods, king of gods, father of the gods, whatever you want to call him, he's, he's the main god. He fell in love with Diane. He saw her in the tower and uh, absolutely fell in love with her. And he came down and he got her pregnant. And she gave birth to Perseus. Now, what what did the Delphi say is that his grandson would kill him? So here he has Perseus. Uh, his daughter has Perseus. So what's he going to do? Because Perseus is supposed to kill him. So he's really worried because he can't kill Perseus because he's the son of Zeus. Because then Zeus would be angry at him. So here's what he does. He takes his daughter and his grandson, throws them in a wooden crate, and I use the image of a bathtub because that's the closest thing I can get with these images. All right. But basically, it was like a small wooden box that he threw his daughter and grandson in and then threw them out into the ocean. Now, uh, other gods and goddesses had pity on Diane and Perseus, and they made sure that uh, Diane and Perseus safely made it to the island of Seraphos where they were found by a fisherman and he raised Perseus as his own and Perseus grew to be a, a grown man. Now, uh, the brother of Dictes was Polydictes, the brother and the king, sorry. And he was in love with Diane and that made Perseus uh, upset because because Polydectes was not a good guy. He he did a lot of things that were real shady, and Perseus didn't like that. And he didn't like that uh, that uh, Polydectes uh, was lusting after his mother. So Polydectes knew that Perseus didn't like him and wanted to get Perseus out of the way. So he hatched a plan, and he made all of his servants or everybody on the island give him a horse. And he knew that Perseus didn't have a horse. So Perseus didn't have a horse to give the, the king. So he said, um, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. You know, I mean, you're the king. I owe you something. So whatever it is, you name it. And so Polydictes says, go kill Medusa. And so Perseus, true to his word, he has to go and kill Medusa. So he sets off uh, from the kingdom in search of killing Medusa. All right, so Athena hates Medusa, and she helps Perseus. And so she tells him to go and visit these three witches. And do I have a name for them? No. All right, he tells him uh, to go visit these three witches. And out of the three witches, there's only one eye that they all share. So they keep passing this one eye between them so that each of them can see. So when one can see, the other two can't see. And they tell him before that, they refuse to tell him where to find Medusa. Because that's why he goes to see them. Uh, he, because they know where Medusa is. They refuse to tell him. So he steals the eye and refuses to give it back until they tell him where Medusa lives. So eventually they tell him where to go and the gods give Perseus all the tools that he'll need for this mission. They give him a bag, a special bag that will hold the severed head of Medusa. And they give him a special sword with which to cut off her head. 
They give him a special shield that has a mirror on the inside. Because uh, you guys know who Medusa is, right? She is the snaky lady with the snakes in her hair. And if you look at her, you are you turn to stone. So he has a mirror on the inside of a shield with which to look at her so he doesn't turn into stone. And then they give him a special helmet that turns him invisible. And they give him winged shoes that allows him to fly. So with all of this, he's able to get to where Medusa is. Uh, she's a gorgon, so she lives in a cave. So in that cave, he finds her asleep and he's able to kill her. So he cuts off her head and puts it in the bag and is and comes back home. And when he comes back and uh, he finds that his mom has locked herself in a closet and Polydectes is banging on the door, demanding that she come out and she's terrified of him. So what does he do? He shows Polydectes the head of Medusa turning Polydectes into stone, thus saving his mother. Well, anyways, he gives the head of, um, of Medusa to Athena, and Athena puts that on her breastplate. It's a piece of armor that goes across the chest, and then that becomes the Aegis. So I want you to write down uh, this uh, definition right here for Aegis. The Aegis is Athena's breastplate, and it has Medusa's head on it. So here is uh, a Perseus cutting off the head of Medusa. And that is over here on the right, that is Medusa, who had helped him along the way. And there in the middle is Medusa holding up, all right, I'm sorry, uh, Athena. Did I say that's Athena on the right helping Perseus cut off the head of Medusa? All right. That's Athena in the middle holding the head of Medusa after Perseus had given it to her. And then right there on Athena's breastplate, her aegis, all right, that's the piece of armor that goes across her chest. She is wearing uh, the aegis, which has Medusa's head on it. And then there is Athena in uh, black figure. And here she is in red figure, but this is black figure. And you can always tell her. She always wears a helmet. She has a spear. She has a shield. That's how you can always tell it's Athena. And also because she's wearing the Aegis. Okay, let me tell you about Heracles. Uh, and let me tell you about the birth of Heracles. Um, have I given the definition of Zeus? Yes, I have. All right. So Zeus fell in love with Alcmene. Now Alcmene was oblivious as to who Zeus was, or she knew who he was, but she didn't know that he had a crush on her. And so Zeus pretends to be, he disguises himself as Amphitryon, Alcmene's husband, who's away at war. So he pretends to be Amphitryon, come back from the war, happy to see her, and they lay in bed together, and um, Zeus has his way with her. Well, later on that night, her real husband comes home from the war, and they do the same thing. So then she becomes pregnant with twins. One of the twins is fathered by Zeus, that's Heracles, and the other one, Iphicles, was fathered by the real Amphitryon. Now, Hera, the wife of Zeus, she is always angry at Zeus. She cannot stand him because he's always having affairs. And, I mean, he has so many affairs, it's not even funny. And we'll talk about that later. But um, she hates Heracles. Because, and, and the reason why she can't do anything to her husband is her husband is the king of the gods. He's more powerful than she is, so there's nothing she can do about it with him. But what she can do is hurt the people that Zeus loves to get back at Zeus. And so Zeus loves Heracles. And so Hera is always uh, doing bad things to Heracles because she hates him because he's the love child of Zeus and Alcmene. Okay, so I told you that Hera hates Heracles. And... She sends him into a mad frenzy. She, she makes him go insane. And he uh, 
has hallucinations that he's fighting monsters and demons. But in reality, he's killing his children and his wife. So it causes him to go insane. But when he comes out of his insanity, uh, he realizes what he's done and is absolutely horrified by what he's done because he loved his wife and he loved his kids. So Heracles goes to Delphi to ask the oracle, what should he do uh, to make this all better? And the oracle tells him, go to Tyrans, serve your cousin, King Eurystheus, for 10 years, performing whatever tasks he asks of you. And so that's what Heracles does, even though he hates it. He hates, because he's the son of Zeus, he thinks he's better than everybody else. So it really bothers him to be subservient to somebody that's not a child of a god. So um, the king, and what's his name? Eurystheus. All right, so Eurystheus gives him 10 tasks to do. And uh, one of the tasks is to slay the Nemean lion. Now, this lion has been going around killing everybody's livestock and eating people's uh, uh, cattle and sheep and children, and it's just been an absolute nuisance. And nobody can kill it because it has magical hide. Uh, the skin of this lion uh, cannot be penetrated with any weapon uh, uh, made by man. So arrows don't work, swords don't work, axes don't work, nothing works. So when uh, Heracles goes to kill it, he, ha he ends up choking it to death. And in this red figure vase right here, you can see that Heracles is wrestling this, uh, this lion and choking it. And in every image of Heracles, he's often depicted wearing lion skin. And that comes from this story that after he killed the lion, he, uh, he, he made a lion skin like cape out of, out of it. Here's a closer view of him fighting the lion. There's another one of him. That's black figure. All right. The second labor of Heracles, Heracles is to uh, kill the nine headed Crinian Hydra. All right. The Hydra is a nine headed snake beast. And the problem is, is that every time you cut off, uh, cut off a head, two more grow in its place. So that makes it uh, impossible to kill. And uh, so what he does, he gets the help of a friend of his. And every time they, he cuts off a head, his friend cauterizes the wound, causing uh, making it so that the heads cannot grow back. And that's how Heracles is able to kill the hydra all right and then the third labor was the capture of the uh, Carinian hind and that's basically a deer this deer has golden horns and uh it's a mythical beast so uh finding it was most of the challenge for heracles he had to go to mythical islands to find this deer and uh to bring it back all right, this boar, um, let's see, do I have? No, that's not it. Okay, so uh, the Erythian boar it was a uh, uh, another beast that was ravaging the land, and this thing was absolutely huge, and it was so terrifying, and... Uh, Heracles defeated it and part of the story goes is that when Heracles uh, defeated it and brought it back when he carried it into the king's palace the king hid from it he was so scared of the thing that he, he hid showing the cowardice of the king all right and then the, another uh, of uh, one of
Another one of Heracles' labors was to clean the Algian stables in a single day. Uh, the problem with this was this, this, these stables were the stables for a whole army, 30,000 horses, and they hadn't been cleaned in 30 years. And you can imagine the amount of dung that uh, builds up in stables of 30,000 horses not been cleaned for 30 years. And it was an absolute horrible, and it was impossible to clean it out. But what Heracles did is he diverted a river to wash through the stables instead of cleaning out the stables himself. So um, uh, that was how he, had, uh, he uh, finished this task. Uh, this black figure vase over here shows him taking a break after he diverted the river. All right, uh, the other task was to slay the Stymphalian birds. These were man killers. These birds killed people. They had beaks made out of bronze. And the marsh where they lived was so, uh, I guess, marshy that uh, Heracles could not walk through it. It was just too, um, too soft on the ground. So Athena helped him by giving him a rattle. And that rattle caused the birds to uh, uh, leave their nests in the marsh and fly out into the sky. And he killed them with arrows dipped in hydra blood. And in this picture, in both of these pictures, it looks like he used a sling. All right. Uh, another task that he was asked to do was to capture the Cretan bull. It was a bull that had uh, gotten away, but this, this was a very special bull. All right. King Minos was given a... Uh, a an amazing bull to sacrifice to Poseidon. It was, you know, like a big, beautiful bull, and uh, King Minos really admired it, and he wanted to keep it instead of sacrificing it to Poseidon. So instead, he kept the bull and he sacrificed a lesser bull to Poseidon. Well, Poseidon got really angry at that and made Minos's wife fall. Whoops, need to fix that and show. Beautiful. All right. All right. Fall in love with the bull. And so it caused her to get pregnant from the bull. So she got, she gave birth to the Minotaur. And that's how the Minotaur was born. Whoops. And so here's a black figure vase showing Heracles. Uh, uh, bringing the bull back. All right. The eighth labor of Heracles was to uh, steal the mares of Diomedes. And you know that a mare is like a horse, a female horse. Well, these were mares were flesh eaters. They ate people. And, but after, and they were wild and crazy and they ate people. But after eating flesh, they became calm. Well, Heracles was able to steal the horses and had his best friend hold them for a while. And the horses ate his best friend. And that really made Heracles angry. So he got revenge on Diomedes by feeding Diomedes to his own horses. All right, so here is Heracles trying to wrestle with the wild horses. And then after they ate, here's Heracles uh, uh like uh, petting a calm horse. All right, the ninth labor of Heracles was to bring back the girdle of Hippolyta. Hippolyta was the queen of the Amazons. And Hippolyta, actually, she, uh, I mean, man, I've got tons of little typos. Where do we go? Are we right here? How about a Y right there? All right. All right. Hippolyta actually liked Heracles and planned to give him the girdle just because they were friends. Uh, and so Hera got mad. You remember that Hera hated Heracles and disguised herself as an Amazon. And so she spread the rumor that Heracles planned to steal the girdle. 
Well, Hippolyta believed the rumor and tried to attack Heracles, resulting in a big battle and bloodshed. And Heracles killed Hippolyta, took her girdle, and sailed away. So this is a red figure of Heracles attacking Hippolyta. And then here is Heracles fighting the Amazons. And then the tenth and uh, final labor of Heracles is the uh, to obtain the cattle of the three-bodied giant Geryon. And uh, Geryon is a three-bodied giant. So let's see. This might be I. You know, even though this is cartoonish, this looks most like what I think Geryon. You know how he could have been a three-bodied giant. Anyways, um, Heracles was able to kill him with a with an arrow tipped in the blood of the Hydra, and you can see Heracles right there wearing his lion skin and shooting an arrow at Geryon, and then up here is a black figure vase of the uh, of the story. All right, so I said there were ten labors, and the king dismissed the first two uh killing the hydria and uh what was the other one let's go back all right he dismissed killing the hydria because he had help from a friend remember the friend that would cauterize the uh the neck as he kill, cut off the heads and then the other one was that he dismissed was uh that he cleaned the aegean stables uh, one of the reasons why he dismissed that is because the owner of the stables paid Her Heracles after he cleaned them. And the king said, well, because you got paid, this doesn't count. So Heracles had to do two more um, uh, labors. And so the 11th one was to steal the th three of the golden apples of Hesperides. Now, nobody knew where these, the tree that has the golden apples of Hesperides was. It was a mythical tree in a mythical place. And the only person that did know was Atlas. And you know Atlas is the guy that holds up the world. Well, Heracles went to go visit Atlas. And Atlas said, I can't tell you where they are. I have to go and get them myself. And so Heracles uh, reluctantly agreed. And uh, Atlas says, well, I can't go do it with the world on my shoulders. Can you hold up the world until I get back? And so if I have a picture of it, yeah. Uh, this is Atlas over here. He's coming back and he has the apples in his hands. And then he decides, you know what? I'm tired of holding up the world. I'm not going to do it anymore. See you later, Hercules. And he's going to leave Hercules there holding the world for all eternity. Uh and that's totally unfair. So Heracles says, all right, all right, I'll hold up the world, but uh, can you just uh, take it just for a second while I tie my shoe and, uh, and then I'll hold it back again. And so Atlas agrees. And as soon as he does that, Heracles takes the apples and runs off. So he's able to get the apples and bring them back. <clears throat> and then the last and final, final, uh, labor of Heracles is the capture and bringing back of Cerberus. And as you well know, Cerberus is the three-headed dog that guards hell. And with the help of several gods, uh, Heracles was able to go and find the, uh, the dog Cerberus and take him into hell. Because you have to eat, there, there's no way that he could have done it himself because people that are not dead are not allowed into Hades because uh, Heracles had to go into Hades and to take back Cerberus. So he had to get special permission from the gods. The gods had to give him certain rights. And, and uh, but anyways, those are the 12 labors of Heracles. And I'm going to stop there for the first day. All right, that's it for today. And until next time, be a little art factory.